Yeah, and I think there's a line between having the will to do something and being willing to do something. You know, I think they're kind of two different things. When you say, you know, you have to have the will, that means that you have to kind of put your pants on, you got to get in the car, and you got to go. But you got to be willing. It's almost as if you're willing to be led, if you're willing to be taught, if you're willing to listen. To me, they're kind of, they're the same, but they're almost opposites. Welcome to Guys Talking Yoga, a podcast created to help get other men into yoga by sharing their stories and the many benefits of the practice. I'm your host, Derek Vandewalker, and today's guest is Leon Barnett. Leon was never a gym guy. After 25 years in the restaurant business and being in recovery for 17, he knew he needed to make a change, but he also knew that change wasn't going to happen if he wasn't willing to make it. In this conversation, Leon and I talk about starting his path with yoga at the age of 54 and his experiences working through those first few classes. We also get into the importance of focus while doing these yoga postures, and most importantly, not worrying about where you're not, but paying attention to and enjoying where you are. So Leon Barnett, welcome to the show and thanks for joining us. Thanks, Derek. Good to be here. So tell us about how you got into yoga and what brought you there. So I was in the restaurant business for many years and my last gig in the restaurant world was I had a little pub with a couple of partners. It's kind of a funny story. We ended up as an episode of Restaurant Impossible. And I don't know if you remember Robert Irvine. He's a celebrity chef. Sure. You know, they come out and they do a makeover on restaurants. And that was kind of the beginning of the end because it was just brutal. You know, they they come in and they want to kind of pit the owners against one another. And they were very successful in doing that. And so, you know, within a couple of years, we dissolved the partnership and I left the business and I took a job in sales. And I found myself with, you know, holidays and nights and weekends off. And I was looking for something. I was, I was never a gym guy. You know, I don't know where I got the idea for yoga. I know my sisters had practiced yoga. I don't think they had a steady yoga practice or, you know, a specific studio that they developed a community within. But, uh, I just was looking for something and I walked into Empowered Yoga in Wilmington and I talked to the gal at the front desk and she was really helpful. And they had a brand new beginners class and I enrolled in that. So part of that brand new beginners class is that they allowed you to take any class that was on the schedule while you are enrolled in that that month-long program. I think the classes were twice a week for the beginner. So I started there and I took that and I took a couple of classes, you know, in between. And then when that was over, you know, they're looking to kind of hold on to people. So they had a living social or Groupon, one of those kinds of deals. So I signed up and I started to go a couple times a week. And then the month was over and they said, hey, we'll extend that same deal for one more month. And at that point they had me and I was, you know, I was in the studio five, six days a week, you know, and I loved it. And I saw a real difference. You know, at first it wasn't the physical or the mental. It was just the community, you know, that everybody was, was welcoming and helpful and all the teachers were awesome and there were no dicks there. It was just cool people. And so I kind of felt I'd found a place that it was just welcoming. And then the practice started to really take off for me. So how many years ago, Ballpark, was this sort of first introduction to yoga? I think this was eight years ago. What was it about yoga that you had heard of, that you knew of? It made you think about, I'll give it a shot. I was never a gym guy, you know, like I was not active. You know, I played golf and I skied, but in between that kind of stuff, I wasn't going to the gym. I don't run. I wasn't moving my body. And that went on for a long time. Spent, you know, 25 years in the restaurant business on my feet. Constantly moving around, carrying things, getting in the car, right? Right. But it doesn't equate to moving your body the right way and, you know, and getting into any kind of shape, you know? So really I was looking for something to fill a time slot. And that's really it. 
So did you know what yoga was when you went like, did you have a sense for what you were getting into? I mean, I kind of, I kind of knew what it was, but not really. What did you think it was? You know, cause obviously a lot of guys have their own expectations. What did you think it was? I didn't think it was as physically challenging as it turned out to be. And what about it is physically challenging to you? Well, holding the poses, getting into the poses, doing the poses properly. You know, that's something that the studio Empowered Wellness is really focused on is that functional movement. And I found out after I took some classes at some other places, I took a Bikram class. I've taken many of those Bikram classes and it seems like they don't really care how you get into the pose. Just get into the pose. Just do it. You know, they don't care if you're hinging your hips or if you're rounding your back or if you're, you know. You're saying that the Bikram class just goes like a locomotive and you just start doing it. You just hang on. Right. And so when you first did your yoga class and you realized this was more of a physical challenge, what were you thinking in those first classes? Like, where did you struggle? Well, I struggled just, you know, with the breath work. I mean, just remembering to breathe? You know, I would hold my breath. I'd go into a pose. You know, I really knew nothing. If I walked in there and they said, okay, everybody get in the warrior pose. I have no freaking clue. You know, I'd heard of downward facing dog, but I didn't know what it is. I didn't know what it looked like. And so I was pretty much a virgin to the whole thing. Yeah. Did you ever get frustrated? Like, eh, maybe this is not for me. You know, No, because it all came back to the people that were there that were so encouraging. The teacher was unbelievable. Her name is Nancy. At that time, she taught all the brand new beginners and she was just so patient and so kind. The other people in the class, you know, I could also see that I was progressing as well as everybody else. And so that gave me some confidence Mm -hmm. that I wasn't completely, you know, unable to do this. Let me come back to what you were just talking about on the idea of progressing. How how did you progress in your yoga practice in your early days? And how do you identify what progression looks like now, several years into yoga? I think what it comes down to is that I was willing, right? And I, I, I don't want to go keep going off track, but, you know, I've been in recovery for 17 years. And one of the major tenets we talk about is that you need to be willing. You need to want to do something. And I kind of felt like that this is something that I wanted to do. And I saw the progression just, you know, in a week by week situation. Now, then I went to some of the public classes. I stayed in the back and I followed along as best I could, but it was a little disheartening to see where I wasn't. Mm Mm-hmm. But, you know, I mean, for whatever reason, I just kept going and liking it and got the encouragement and I felt myself getting stronger. And I mean, it is hot yoga. So I'm in a hot room and I thought it was kind of cool, you know, that I was doing hot yoga. So what made it cool for you? Like, what about it? I thought it was cool because it's completely counter to what everybody in the world knew about Leon before that. And I just like to surprise people. And and by the way, for those people, what do you think was their perception of Leon before he got into yoga? Certainly not as a yogi. If you knew me back in my restaurant management days, I was a hothead. I was insensitive. I was a bully. And I, I hate to say that out loud, but it's true. You know, years ago, I worked at a restaurant on a college campus and we had a lot of success there. And it was a really busy, popular place. And I had a lot to do, myself and my team had a lot to do with really increasing sales and doing a lot of things. But, you know, along the way, I was still drinking at the time and working on a hangover every day doesn't make you the happiest guy around. (laughs) You know, and I was a jerk. So that's the guy most of the world knew, right? And so getting into recovery allowed me to open my mind up to things like yoga. You know, it taught me to be willing. Yeah. And it taught me that I didn't have to be a dick all the time. How does yoga help complement AA and being in recovery? So Dr. Bob and Bill Wilson founded AA, right? 
Well, they got their stuff from somewhere, right? They didn't just make this stuff up, you know. They read books. There was a group called the Washingtonians, and there was other attempts at programs to help people get sober, you know. So there's no original ideas left. Like everybody that spouts something is spouting something that they heard somewhere else, right? So these guys had their ideas on what it should look like, and they developed this program, and it's been super successful. It's been super successful for me, and I'm full of gratitude for the guys that have come before me, the guys that have helped me on my journey. But I didn't know any of that about yoga when I got into it until I took the teacher training. And then, you know, we start to dig into the yamas and the niyamas, and we start to dig into some of the Buddhist principles. And you see the similarities are all there with the tenets of AA and Buddhist philosophy. So, you know, it was just, to me, it was just cool. I think to get back to that word you use, willing, that was something that came out of the program. You have to will yourself towards going to yoga, right? You have to will yourself to be present in yoga. You have to will yourself to work with the arc of the class. I mean, sometimes, you know, I'm in someone's yoga class and the teacher might take it in a different direction that doesn't really work great for my body. And I just have to be willing to try to be present and stay with with his or hers vision and plan. But at the same time, sort of respect that there's certain things my body can't do or I have to back off or grab a prop or just slow it down. But that willing probably shows up, I would imagine, for a lot of people who are paying attention to their practice whenever they're in the studio, right? Yeah, and I think there's a line between having the will to do something and being willing to do something. You know, I think they're kind of two different things. When you say, you know, you have to have the will, that means that you have to kind of put your pants on, you got to get in the car, and you got to go. But you got to be willing. It's almost as if you're willing to be led, if you're willing to be taught, if you're willing to listen. To me, they're kind of, they're the same, but they're almost opposites. It sounds like willing, the way you're describing, is being open and non-judging and just going with where you are, where you're headed and not really making a hard decision about anything. You're right. The will is just making a commitment to something, but willing is is a constant process, right? Yeah. So the community of yoga, (laughs) <laughs> so one of the things that I've struggled with, like a lot of people during this pandemic, is the lack of social interaction. You know, we're, we're, we're coming back, and in many ways we are back, in some ways we're not quite there. But when it comes to yoga, there's nothing like being in the studio doing yoga with other people. Whether you're leading the class or whether you're just, you're just a student in the back, The online yoga classes, I think, are also great. I think there's a benefit to having access anytime you want to do that, but there's nothing like being in the room. And I'm curious, what about the community in the room and in the class? Not so much the community of yoga, which is another another place we'll go in a moment, but just being in the classroom. Why does that matter? And why is that important for any guy who's starting his practice or, or trying to develop his practice? You know, for me, when COVID first came and everybody was scrambling, you know, we scrambled and, and we put together a online program and I taught some online classes. I think they, they're probably still on the website and I was practicing at home, but my practice suffered during that time. You know, I couldn't see other people practicing. I mean, you know, I need to look in the mirror and see Ted or Sally or somebody how they're hinging their hips, you know, how they're lifting their heart, how they're moving in order for my practice to grow. I mean, I can listen to the teacher and I can do what I always do, but if I do what I always do, I'll get what I always get. I need the energy of the people around me. It's a vibe. When I first started in there, guys that I knew back in the day, you know, they'd be like, oh yeah, you go for the yoga pants. That's the only reason you're going, (laughs) you know? I kind of concerned myself with that. And I thought, is that why I'm going? And I thought, well, hell, it is a bonus. There's no question about it. But, you know, you find that it doesn't even register. Yeah. You're in the room, you're following a practice. And when I realized that, 
it was like almost a watershed moment for me that I was in my practice. You know, it's it's interesting. It's almost a knee jerk reaction by a lot of guys to comment on some of the attractive bodies and people in yoga class, right? And I know girls and guys are checking out each other. It's just it's just the way the birds and the bees work a little bit. But I really think guys quickly find out through their own experience, through their own challenge of trying to even just do the class or finish the class, that they really can't be paying attention to other people. And it gets back to your point about how when you first started, you were like, I was really consumed with where I wasn't. And pretty soon you really start to realize where you are. And, you know, that might be very humbling and frightening to, to some certain new practitioners, like most of the guys, you know, coming into class and they find out this is way harder. You know, they want to leave because either they're, they're breathing hard or they realize that they're, they're not in as great a shape they thought they were. And I think that's where this practice starts to really get its hooks in you, which is facing a little bit of the reality for where you are in your path. And I think over time, you keep working on where you are and where you're going and, and paying less attention to other people in the classroom or just in your world and your life who maybe don't align with, you know, not in accord with your own nature. And you realize that you've got a lot in you that can do some amazing things. And I, I found physically in my practice that I've been able to work through my own limitations and challenges in my body. And you have a deep focus after a while in your practice. Sure, you're going to have a deep focus if you're struggling with a pose. But even when you're not struggling and you're sort of finding your, 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 your own little edge in a place where you're in control, you're breathing, but you're not heavy breathing, that's where really it gets interesting. And I think you start to really start to see and feel and know the benefits. I mean, I don't talk to a lot of guys that don't practice yoga because they don't really want to talk about it. I mean, you know, they're either practicing or they're not. I'm not, I'm not out there on the corner pushing yoga. It's a hard, it's a hard sell if they don't know what they're buying. Yeah, right? it's a hard sell. But, you know, as a teacher, you know, I get guys in and I got a gal that's a regular, she, she's somebody that comes to my class a lot and I end up practicing with her a lot. Her husband, he was coming in for a while and then he, he stopped and for whatever reason. And now he's back because he had some back things and, you know, he's trying. I think that the hump for me was when I stopped worrying about everybody else's practice mm -hmm. and I was focusing on mine. And that was kind of a big moment for me when I realized that I was doing this for me and I didn't really care about anybody else around me or why they were doing it or how they were doing it. It was intimidating to me early on to see these people, you know, go into these poses. And I mean, just standing on one leg. I mean, I'm 64 years old, right? And I started when I was, I don't know, 55, 56, somewhere around there. And, you know, standing on one leg wasn't easy. And, you know, and there's still some days where my balance is not where I'd like it to be. I mean, if you just pick the guy off the street randomly, you know, 50-year-old guy and said, I want you to stand on one leg for a minute. Most people can't do that. You just can't find the balance. It gets harder. Yeah, the older you get. Yeah, man. So I want to go back to community because there's a lot in there. Because I know that many people who go through the program certainly have a very tight community. You know, like folks who go through the military have a tight community, tight experience. And, you know, the yoga studio can be a really tight community. So you've been teaching for a number of years, right? Correct. Tell the listeners about the class you teach. Tell us a little bit about how you teach and tell me us about why you teach. The class I teach is stationary sequence. That's kind of the practice that I kind of latched on to. And it is a series of 26 postures. And, you know, they're basically you go into this posture and you're holding it anywhere from 15 seconds to a minute. So how I teach is that I like to have fun, Derek. And my class is nothing if not that. You know, I am always talking to people, you know, and I talk out loud to them and I utter encouragement and I bring the jokes and it's not not serious. Yeah. If, if you know what I mean, we're there for a reason. And I have regular people in my class and I'll call them out if they're slacking. And listen, I slack too. You know, there's classes where I'm there. 
and I'm doing my practice, but you know what? I can't hold this boat and I'm coming out. What does slacking look like to you? I mean, how do you see it and know it when you, when you see it in another person in the room? I see it like the transitions between poses. There's a difference between somebody that is not pushing it because they don't have it that day to push and other people that you know that they have the energy and they're just not focused on, you know, for whatever reason. You're willing because you showed up, but you're not present. You maybe you got something going on. Everybody's got some kind of shit that you bring into the yoga room. And, you know, fortunately for me, usually within about 15 minutes, whatever I brought into that room has kind of evaporated. I mean, it's literally out of tough love, kind of making sure that they know that you're paying attention. And that's their opportunity, whether or not they want to get present and get focus, or they're just going to go through a month and drink. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and listen, I mean, and you can tell right away if it's not working for them, you know, and you just leave them alone. I'm not, I'm not the bully that I once was. You know, I, I like good music. I'm a fan of the sixties and the seventies. You're not going to hear a lot of yoga bowls in, in my class. Right. You're going to get a little Rolling Stones. We're yeah, all you're them. not, you're not going to hear the flute. You're going to hear the electric guitar. You're going to hear something good. Well, you know what? I think it's an energy that I think a lot of guys can relate to. I think knowing this is a space that, you know, hey, you want you want everyone to feel comfortable, but also a lot of it's like, you know, what's your style? What works for you? What gives you energy and makes you as a teacher excited about it? And you can't be any other teacher than, than Leon. And so whatever is your style for teaching, that's what you're sharing. And it's all good. So let me ask you this. The last question was, why do you teach? It is so gratifying. I never in a million years pictured myself teaching a yoga class. I mean, let alone taking a yoga class. I just didn't see it coming. And it wasn't like from the first time, you know, but once I enrolled in the teacher training, I knew that I wanted to teach. You know, I feel like people enjoy it. I feel like people feel like I'm engaged with them. I'm animated. I want people to feel the energy that I feel. That's what makes it in the studio so great. You can't get the energy through a laptop screen doing an on-demand class. And that's what makes this thing awesome when you get in the studio and you're with a teacher who's comfortable in his or her own skin. They got their own style that works for them. And they help make a place that's conducive to make people willing to keep right. working on their practice. And that's just what's so awesome about being uh, sharing some of those experiences. As an aside to that, I love teaching beginners that are fully engaged in a practice, you know, because they're going for it, you know, and and you can show them something and, and they're appreciative and they're listening and they're trying and it's just so gratifying. Are you a teacher or do you teach yoga? I do teach yoga. I don't teach it that frequently, but it's something I'm looking to do more in the next year or two. You know, it's just so gratifying when you have somebody there that responds to your adjustment, to your touch, to your, to your voice, you know, and you get done and they're like, wow, that was great. You know, thanks so much. And, you know, oh, I get that. Okay. You know, and, you know, there's other people that have been practicing for 40 years. You know what? I don't even bother. You know, they're doing their thing. They're on their path. Yeah. And, you know, it's not that they're not interested in what I have to say. You know, but they are in their own headspace, you know, and they could be focused as hell. Like, I don't know. Sometimes it's like, even if you're an experienced practitioner, just being in somebody else's class, you're sort of knitting that class into your own practice when you have a pretty experienced practice. And it just, it, you're, you're there, you're with the class, but you're also sort of working on your own things. If you know what you're doing. So Leon, as we look to close here, we talked about the pre-yoga Leon and the Leon after having started his yoga practice. Right. How do you describe how Leon is different from the old Leon? You know, you mentioned it is feeling comfortable in your skin. That recovery tries to get you in that place where you feel comfortable in your skin. Because, you know, as you're drinking or you're using drugs or whatever it is that, that got you into recovery, you know, it's looking to fill that hole 
that hole in your soul or that hole in your belly or the hole in your mind, you know, you're looking for something and you find it through, you know, whatever substance that you, that you choose. And, you know, and for a lot of people, it could be tobacco or sugar or anything, right? Anything. There's, there's, there's lots of things, but, you know, and until you find a way to kind of plug that hole without those substances, you never really want to get comfortable in your skin. Yeah. And through recovery, through my practice with the guys from the Lyman house, I've been able to, to kind of fill that hole. It's made me certainly a, a way better guy. You know, I, I, I am way more patient, sometimes to a fault. You're too Zen. You're so Zen now, right? Well, you know, I don't know that if I'm always Zen, but I, you know, I'll tell you, there is a Zen to me that certainly never existed before. And I attribute that to initially AA and recovery. And then yoga is really kind of closing the loop for me. You know, for me, it was the missing piece. Well, listen, Leon, I know we've been talking for like six or seven months. I know the universe has sent us both some turns along the way. And this has taken a while to connect, but it is awesome to connect. I really appreciate you sharing your story and some time with us. I look forward to getting in the studio with you. And just thanks again for joining us. My pleasure. Hey, I hope you enjoy this conversation. You know, Leon's been through a lot and he knows his stuff. If you're struggling with the sometimes humbling experience of working through those initial yoga postures and classes, just remember what Leon shared. The hump for me was when I stopped worrying about everyone else's practice and I focused on mine. And that was kind of a big moment. Thanks for listening. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast and check us out on Instagram at GTY Podcast.